Awesome. All right, what is going on, guys? So Joe Ankum here for the Ankum Athletics Podcast, and this is actually the second podcast I've ever done solo. So if you guys are tuned into the Natty Roundtable Podcast, you've probably seen um, this sort of style before, but I did one with Manny, and I'm proud to have my second guest on here, Alex Tran. So if you guys have not seen Alex, you actually probably, if you're in the Waukesha area, you probably have heard of the guy before. If you know me, we both went to North. We're both North graduates. So yep. he actually graduated from Carroll. How long ago did you graduate from Carroll, man? uh 2017 so okay. two years ago about. two years ago so, yeah, so he's been so he's been doing online coaching through at performance and he also has been doing currently he works at in person at cryo vive cryo, am i saying that correctly cryo vive cryo vive perfect so yeah, yeah. so making sure like i said just just kind of get a little introduction who he is so he is uh, he does have his cscs which is certified um strength and conditioning specialist and also, he does have his um, certified sports and nutritionist um, certification as well. So, very knowledgeable guy. Like I said, that's why I have him on the podcast here. And we actually kind of prompted this from an article he has recently written about overall just kind of supplements in general and their role and really their importance in general. So, supplements are something we both get asked about a ton. Like, And it's just like the typical questions and really like he you know, puts at the top of this article – what pre-work, pre-workout are you on? And that's always what people are asking, trying to figure out how to get to that next level. And they think that that is going to kind of be the make or breaker. So we're going to talk about today what is really important, what is really actually scientifically backed in terms of getting you results proven, and then what kind of is maybe just going to be a waste of your money um, and something that you could probably save a little bit on and put your willpower in, and money in into elsewhere. So we're going to talk about first, I want to ask him just kind of a generalized sort of question here. A lot of times people don't understand really the, the, the supplements themselves when it comes to the ingredients. So give them a little bit of a rundown in terms of proprietary blends, what that is, and then kind of the difference of what you actually would want to look for in a, a supplement in general. And then we'll kind of go into a little bit more in depth from there. Um, well, a proprietary blend, it's essentially just a concoction of several different ingredients in one uh, I guess, supplement or pre-workout or, I guess, yeah, brand, of course. Um, usually when you're looking for, for something that's effective, it's it's kind of hard to, to know, especially in blends where occasionally they won't list the exact dosage. They'll just kind of say like, it'll, it'll list like 350 milligrams and then several different ingredients right off of that. So it, it, it can be, it can be pretty tricky with, with blends. Um, but knowing what to look for, it, it definitely takes some some research on your own time um, or listening to podcasts like this one. Um, it's it, it can be tricky, and there's there's a lot of information out there. Um, and knowing who to trust or knowing which brands are are credible and which are not, it, it's all a tricky process. So hopefully. Hopefully this can kind of clear up a little of the fog that's that's present. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's and that's kind of why I started it out. So a good example of a proprietary <laughs> blend would be like a very common pre-workout. It's like C4, for instance, has for sure. proprietary Everyone's blend. Everyone's probably tried C4. So, yeah, exactly. So you see, if you look on the back, it'll basically say like, they always have a cool name. It's like caffeine matrix or something. And they list all these yes. ingredients, but they don't have an exact amount. Because quite frankly, as I'll have him kind of elaborate on here, supplements are very unregulated, which is very backwards when you really think about it because it's usually for bettering your health or at least it's marketed anyways that way. So if you don't really even have the the actual requirements to list what is actually in it, well, of course, as a business, you're always going to try to take the profit margin where you can, right? So that would mean underdosing things. And that's where, as he's talking about, really good point. You have to do your research because there is companies out there doing it right way, the right way because they understand that there's an opportunity here to make some money because people like us and people who are watching this, where you're, you're in, if you're watching a podcast like this, you're trying to get more informed. So at the point in which you are more informed, you're going to make a better decision with what you're spending your money on if you do choose supplements. But I want to go into kind of a more general question here, man. So if someone okay. comes up to you and they do say, what is, what's, what's the best supplement for me? I'm a beginner. I've, I've been lifting for six months, Alex. Um, I see that you're jacked, dude. I see you're lifting heavy, dude. You're strong. I want to be like you. What what supplements are you taking? What's your first? What's your next? Uh, your next step there? Of course. Um, <laughs> well, it it definitely depends. And the first question you'd have to ask them is what are their goals. It, it doesn't. I don't think asking me what I take 
is going to always be relevant to what they should take just because we might have different goals. Um, and there's definitely different, there's definitely very effective supplements out there, but they can be for a very specific goal. Like for instance, um, beta alanine, I think it's, there's a lot of research behind it. There's a lot of stuff that says it's effective, but not every individual is going to find benefit from that supplement just because it doesn't relate to what they're trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, it, it, I, I definitely have to ask them what their goals are. I'd go from there. Um, there's, there's usually, there's a pretty small list of supplements that I, that I actually think there's significant benefit from. Um, but again, a supplement is a supplement. It's definitely not needed. It's, it's there for you if you can't get it from your diet, which in some cases it's, it's not possible to get the appropriate amounts from a diet. So supplements can be beneficial, but, but yeah, definitely identifying what they're trying to achieve that. That's the first step. No, I think that's a great answer, man. And I think segueing off of that, maybe go into what you would say is the most beneficial, maybe, I don't know, whatever you, what you have in mind, but maybe top three if there's a lot of them or just really what you think would be the most beneficial out of, out of all the, because there is so many supplements out there. So. Uh, yeah. So probably number one, um, whey protein. It's protein. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that can be achieved through a proper diet, but I will say that for certain goals, especially for weight loss goals, protein intake, it can definitely get pretty high and achieving that with diet alone, it can be difficult. So I would say protein or whey protein is probably going to be number one on the list. Um, number two, it, it'd have to be a toss up. I'd, I'd say for most people with the general fitness goal, I think creatine can be pretty beneficial. Um, it's, it definitely has its place for, for strength and muscle. Um, there's a lot of research behind that. And now researchers are actually, they're trying to, to figure out how it can play a role in the prevention of like neuro, neuro, um, degenerative diseases like Parkinson's. Totally. I've, uh, I've heard a little bit about that as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's being looked into for, for brain health as well as, Interesting. um, the CNS health and all that fun stuff. So. In, in, research on that. No, well, sorry to interject, but is creatine, correct me if I'm wrong with this, creatine is the most actually research supplement, right? If, if I'm not. To my knowledge, it is. Yes. There's, there's a lot of research behind okay. it. There's going to be more research produced. So yes, I, I'd say creatine is probably the, the most research supplement on the market right now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then is there, would there be any besides creatine though? Besides kind of, I know you mentioned whey and then creatine. Which... Yep. Whey, creatine. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits for ca from caffeine intake as well. Okay. Um, I will say not everyone has a tolerance for caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those people. I don't. I choose not to take caffeine because if I if I take anything more than like 200 milligrams, which is probably a standard dose in a pre workout, or even it, that could be on more the lower end. Normally, yeah. yeah. I say. If I take anything more than that, I'm super jittery and I get nauseous. But there's a lot of research behind behind caffeine and its effect within the weight room as well as on a track or, or runners. Runners can experience great benefits from caffeine. Um, there's I wouldn't say there's there's um there's some belief that that caffeine can have a role in in weight loss and there's you can probably find caffeine in almost any weight loss or fat burner supplement. Yeah. Um, it's kind of true, but the the metabolic boost from caffeine is very mild. I don't think it it will have too much of a benefit mm -hmm. in that respect. But for most athletes or for most people that, that want to elevate their, their, um, their gym performance, caffeine can probably have a pretty good role. Um, as far as someone like you, who you'd be a really good person to ask who does have the jitters and kind of feels that like almost like overstimulation from it. Have you tried mm -hmm. anything with I know there's a lot of market like uh, marketing for people who, or pre-workouts that are, have like L-theanine in it to kind of help reduce that. Is there? I, I don't know if there's any research actually out on that 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 proves that. But <laughs> do you notice if you've done that yourself or you've tried to do that? Because I know a lot of people they at least they at least report that they feel a lot more calm. It's like a like a harness yeah. focus. Yep. Yep. So I've I don't think there's research on L-theanine for gym performance. I know there definitely is for it's effect to kind of dull caffeine. There's, there's some okay. research to support that. 
I myself have never tried L-theanine or any of the nootropics that are out there. Um, interesting. I think that they're they're an interesting topic, and I think there's definitely potential with them. Yeah, so, that's and that's something interesting too because I have taken. There's been very few times I've actually taken melatonin um, and before bed, and mm -hmm. the melatonin that I do have, I notice it does have L-theanine in it as well. Right. And that was my only my only pre-introduction to that was from pre-workout and having in actually have taken a few pre-workouts with it in it and um i personally i'm like i have a higher caffeine tolerance like i can withstand caffeine i don't feel super jittery um okay. unless i'm taking like an extreme amount sure. um but but i like i, I so i guess I, ca I can't really compare it with the l-theanine or say that i notice any difference um yeah. but i did take it with that and i just noticed that that was interesting so is l-theanine just can is, is it considered a nootropic then it is correct okay uh, interesting so yeah, yes, kind i mean of no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a a blanket statement, a nootropic. I think technically caffeine is still is it's considered uh, a nootropic too. Okay. Well, even like but, people like even consider nicotine. Like I've heard of that being considered a nootropic. Sometimes it's like, so yeah. I, that's interesting. I think it's but, just any supplement that kind of helps or that kind of influences cognitive function. Okay. I think I, I'm not. I'd have to. I'd have to check myself on the definition, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it's, it's close to that. Interesting, for sure. Well, I want to ask you that that's really solid. So those are three main things. Is there any other things that you like really want to throw in there where you'd even be worth mentioning by chance or um Yeah, um I mean there's beta alanine, I said that before. I think it has its benefits, but I think it's for a specific population. Um so what it does in the body is it it fights off so essentially when you when your muscle contracts it there's metabolic reactions that take place and a byproduct of it is hydrogen ions. And that's essentially the burning sensation that you feel with high rep repetitions. Okay. Um, many people, many people chalk that up to lactic acid, but it's it's the hydrogen ions that that are the the, the main culprit of that. So with beta alanine supplementation, um, it it increases the carnosine content within the muscle, and carnosine it functions to delay the the feeling of the burn or that sensation for sure so, no that's that's interesting because i have one of the pre-workouts i've taken i don't know if you've seen me talking about pure pump it has carnosine in it and yeah. I've, I've, I've often talked to that's actually what i'd say i mean very like especially talking to a, like the average person like i don't want to honestly i don't <laughs> i couldn't even explain it the, like i i have no clue the yeah. <laughs> actual science but i'm like you you could you less time before you feel the burn and people are like oh they understand that usually yeah, but, pretty uh, much. but no so that makes sense though but, so but your body actually produces that so you're you're just supplementing it in with more of the carnosine. Yep. So you're essentially you're just increasing the the carnosine levels in okay. your body. Sim similarly, like with creatine, you when you supplement with creatine, you're increasing the stores. When you supplement with beta alanine, you're increasing the storage of carnosine. Okay. Um, and that essentially gives you the more potential to to increase your work capacity. So that that can that can result in more more repetition or longer sprints or yep. Anything high intensity, it can essentially increase that or improve that that component. Interesting. That totally makes sense. And um, I guess my one question would be, um, besides beta alanine, maybe you're going to touch on it, but like, what about like somebody who's like, hey, should I take a multivitamin? Um, for general health, I think it has its place. Um, I've heard that it, there's no really research that says taking a multivitamin every single day can improve health. Um, I would, I'd obviously advocate for, for getting your, your vitamins and minerals through diet, yeah. through, diet through your, your vegetables, your, your fruits and everything else. I don't think it's detrimental to health and I don't think it won't have any poor effects if you were to choose a multivitamin. Um, I, I think part of the reason why multivitamins might not have the greatest effect or might not be as good as as diet is because of the bioavailability, bioavailability of some of the nutrients or ingredients within a multivitamin. And sometimes even ingredients within a multivitamin, they might block the absorption of other ingredients as well. Okay. Um, I know that calcium and iron and vitamin C, those all kind of, they kind of compete for absorption. Okay. Um, or Especially they can, if they're all at once and yeah. versus from their natural sort of derivatives correct and they might also and some some vitamins might even 
um, increase absorption rate. So it, it, it depends. It's hard to say what components of a multivitamin work and do not work just because of the, there's just so many things within it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's harmful. I think if there is a benefit, it's going to be minimal. I don't, I don't know if it's necessary. And I, I definitely think diet can be, should be stressed more for, for vitamins and, and minerals. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And actually back to like my first question about supplements, I always like, I always kind of give people a jab when they ask me that. I'm just like, well, uh, good diet and exercise and good sure. good sleep habits. And they're usually like, what? And like, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then I kind of go from there. But um, but I'm that's kind of me being a smart ass at the same time. <laughs> but yeah. um, but no, I totally agree though. It's I think it, like you were talking about, it really depends on on the person. Um, but I, one thing I want you to go into a little bit more on um, would be creatine. That's something I get asked about a lot. Um, and I know from offhand, like, like I always say, the creatine, you can, you're getting it from red meat typically and the, the yeah. basically you're taking it in a more concentrated form. That's basically, like you said, you're increasing, um, the ability to basically produce more energy essentially. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. For high so, intensity activity. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of go into that a little bit, maybe, um, talk about a little bit of the research on it or what is, what is, what is proven that creatine can do for you. And then just overall, maybe say, if you would say, taking creatine, especially based on the, the cost and everything, maybe going to that and it's sure. worth for someone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I definitely think most people, if they're, if they have the goals of increasing muscle and or strength, I think creatine is, is, should be a staple supplement that they, they should continue to take. Um, there's, there's some, there's old misconceptions that, that have theorized that you need to, to cycle your creatine. Um, that's not the case. It's, there's, there's nothing to really support that claim, and it's, I think it stems from, from the the, the fact that you need to cycle steroids, and some people have kind of thought creatine was a steroid back then, and it's yeah. definitely not the case. I mean, when you're cycling hormones, you definitely need to you need to cycle them, otherwise, well, that's that's a topic for a different time. <laughs> no, um, it's, essentially, you. you don't need to you don't need to cycle your creatine, so it's something that you need to just take every single day regularly um as far as dosing goes um there's 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 debate on whether you need to do a loading phase or not it's definitely not required to do a loading phase there's there's some benefits to it if you were to just intake your the maintenance level which is it's it's recommended to be three to five grams per day for the normal person for larger people you may need to up that intake to like 10 grams a day but it depends on the person um but if you were to just take that intake only that intake and not do a loading phase it takes approximately a a little bit less than a month i think i think there's a study that says it takes about 28 days for muscles to be saturated with creatine so if you were to just do a loading phase and that takes about a week you might experience the benefits a little bit sooner but again it's definitely not it's not um it's not a requirement to experience the benefits at all Okay. Um, what about, I was going to say, I don't know if you're going to mention, but people always ask me water retention. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm happy you said that. So, so yeah, technically creatine, it, their, their water retention is a result of it. Um, a lot of it is within the muscle. It's not within or outside of the muscle. So a lot of people think that when they take creatine or not, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but there's, there's a fair amount of people that think when you take creatine that you're, you're going to blow it. And yep. it's usually not the case. Um, creatine, it, it's it, it's stored within the muscle, and that's that's where the water follows. So if anything, it'll make your your muscles more bulgy, um, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, mus- muscles <laughs> are <laughs> muscles are already primarily water to begin with. So so there, there's really no concern with with water retention. And there's even Brad Schoenfeld or Shanefield, however you say his name. There's there's he has he's theorized that that cellular swelling can actually influence Inhibit. hypertrophy yeah. and it has yeah. positive benefits on that. So, so that's one mechanism behind creatine's ability to, to, um, to promote muscle gain. It's because it, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it has to do with the swelling of, of that. and also has to do with the ability for the muscle to continue to produce force and work capacity just because with high intensity activity, Creatine is is it's part of that. It's part of that energy system. So increasing intake 
of, of creatine has the ability to improve that, that side of sports performance and ultimately induce greater gains in muscle and strength. Um, yeah. No, that's solid, dude. What One question I do have for you, because I've had a cl- few clients who take creatine monohydrate, which is the cheapest out there and also the most common. What mm-hmm. do you say? I know there is other forms of creatine out there. They're a little bit more expensive. Sure. Why are they a little bit more expensive? And then would somebody be benefiting from, because I do know that some of them are going to be better for the stomach and digestion. Um, yeah. Is that just how they were like actually derived or is it the process behind that? I don't know if that would even be something you would really know about, but I'm sure you, so, you do. <laughs> to my knowledge, I mean, there's there's been, there's creatine, which is one of the ingredients that have, I guess it's it's like a, it's a variation of creatine. It's kind of, okay. it's laced with something. It's supposed to, help it survive the digestion process within the stomach. All right. um, there's also creatine HCL, which is supposed to have kind of the same concept behind it. There's not much research behind it, behind either of those. Um, I don't think it's worse than creatine monohydrate, but I don't think it's that much better to begin with. Okay. Just because creatine monohydrate, the absorption, it's, it's already pretty high. Um, people don't generally have an issue with, with that going by their digestive system and absorbing it into, into the muscles or into the bloodstream and then their muscles. So I, I don't think there's going to be any added benefit for paying that extra cost for, for something that isn't creatine monohydrate. Um, I think creatine monohydrate, just because there's that's the, the form of creatine that's most commonly researched, I think that there's no reason to kind of deviate from, from that form. Okay. No, that totally makes sense. Um, and I guess the other thing I do want to ask is like, but let's say someone you're talking about having it be consistent in your system. I think you said 28 days, about a month. Yeah. Where, like, so let's say I didn't take it for a day. Would that throw that process off? No, it's usually, it takes probably a week and a half or two weeks for, for creatine levels to decrease to baseline. It probably, it definitely varies on how much exercise you do. I'm sure, I'm sure if you exercise more often, you do intense exercise more often, your creatine stores will deplete a lot faster than that. Um, it, it depends on on the activity level of the individual. Okay. Um, I, but at, if you if you miss a day, it, it's not going to be detrimental. You'll be okay. It's when you're missing a couple of days or a week that you're going to start yeah. to have to get it back to that same storage level baseline yep. again. Pretty okay. much. No, that totally makes sense. And do you worry about time of day you're taking it, or is it just making sure you're getting it in in those 24 hours? No, I mean, there's there's some theories that if you take it before, during, or after a workout, it might have more benefit. But I all the research I've seen is it's just it, as long as it's every day, regardless of the time of day, it's it's going to have its benefits. It's, the timing of a creatine isn't something to stress over. Okay, solid. No, that's solid, man. I guess one other question I we could kind of finish up with this because this might be a little bit of a detailed answer. What would be the benefit? I know, because I know offhand in terms of when we get into, you mentioned whey protein. Yeah. What would be, because people ask me a lot of times, like casein, what is, what's, what's up with that? Like um, with the isolates out there, what is up with that? I know that casein obviously is slower digesting. That's usually what the, the main thing I reference. Um, sure. and, and, but, but other than that, and I know it's obviously how it's derived and um, that sort of thing in terms of um, the overall makeup of it. But why would someone want to use whey versus an isolate versus casein if they had some sort of kind of confusion on that or why there even is differences. Sure. Well, I think, I think the reason why casein exists is because of its potential to kind of keep protein synthesis elevated for longer durations. And okay. it's, it's, it's marketed to as like a pre-sleep or yeah, it's, it's yeah. You're supposed to take it before bed and essentially synth- protein synthesis is con- it's elevated throughout your sleep. Um, I think there is, there's the potential for casein. I don't know if it, I don't think it's, it's a requirement. If you're, I think total protein intake should be the main focus. I think casein, if it, it'll just, it'll be an added benefit. I don't think it's a requirement. I don't think the added benefit is going to be significant though. Yeah. Don't overanalyze um, it. Yeah. And as far as the different levels or different forms of, of way, I think, Isolate and hydrolyze, 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 I don't know how you say it, but. Yeah, no, I hear you. <laughs> I <know> yeah. <laughs> Those two forms are, or whatever, yeah, I don't even yeah, know. <laughs> they're going to be the, the highest quality of, of the ways. I think those are going to be better than your concentrates. 
Okay. Um, so you're going to get more bang for your buck if you were to, to go that route. Um, is it going to be significantly better than, than whey concentrate? Um, probably not. I But I think it's, if you wanted the extra edge, maybe the, the hydrolysate or the isolates, those are going to be the ones that you should strive for. So, and, and I guess one other question I know offhand, it's leucine that a lot of times people argue that some of the proteins are short on, correct? With, yeah. With the, with the amino acid profiles. So yep. I guess maybe to like, I know because you don't really have to get into the, the back end of that, but if someone was looking for a good way, what is something you look for with that? Um, if there is anything they can kind of spot to see like, okay, is this going to be reputable besides just knowing the brand itself, if they were kind of maybe more of a, a layman to, or just getting into things. Sure. I think, I think many of the the manufacturers out there, they'll, they'll list all of the, the amino acids and then all the, the milligrams within, um, or the, the profiles within the, their product. Um, I think when it comes to leucine, you're probably going to look for at least three grams, um, probably up to five or six grams. Mm -hmm. it's, it's probably uncommon to see something that high within a whey protein supplement, though. 